Place your advance order now on Amazon for the very first volume of the New Thinking Aloud Dialogue series, Is There Life After Death? Publication date is June 1st. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we'll be talking about psychedelics and the soul. My guest is Rachel Harris. She has been a psychotherapist for more than four decades, starting out in the 1960s as a uh, staff member at the Esalen Institute. She is author of Listening to Ayahuasca, New Hope for Depression, Addiction, PTSD, and Anxiety. Her newest book, which we'll be talking about, is Swimming in the Sacred, Wisdom from the Psychedelic Underground. Rachel lives in the state of Maine on a remote island. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Rachel. It's a real pleasure to be with you. It's been a few years. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be here. Your new book is profound uh, in my mind. And, and the reason I say that, and I, I know, I happen to know for a fact that many other reviewers have said as much as well, is because you've discovered and reported on a hidden treasure, really. Women who have been involved in the psychedelic underground, as, as you call it, for many, many decades and who have been serving, I think, as spiritual guides for people at great risk to themselves and totally immersing themselves in, in the underground culture of, of psychedelics. And what your book points out is that these people have, over many decades, acquired a certain wisdom that completely transcends all of the, the new work that we talk about a lot in the so-called psychedelic renaissance, the, the new uh, crop of uh, therapists and researchers uh, ha don't have a half of the experience that these women have. That's right. We don't want to lose their voices and we're at risk because they, they, they are continuing to work underground. So they're not giving talks at the conferences. And the interesting thing, Rachel, is that you yourself almost qualify to be a member of this group. You've been around pretty much as long as they've been. You've been exposed to psychedelics. You're familiar with all the, the literature, but you're very clear that you would not consider yourself such a person. Oh, no, I'm very clear because basically I'm afraid of everything. And they are not. They are afraid of nothing. And so, yeah, there's no way I qualified. I was, I knew many of the people they trained with in the 60s. I was around. Um, one woman, when I met, I went to meet her, we recognized each other. We had been around in the same circles. But no, I, I never really qualified. These women uh, were just courageous to take any, of, any and all of the medicines at all the different levels of dosages. I, I was always, and I continue to be very careful and, uh, and cautious with, with my own journeys. But does such bravery really recommend itself as someone you would want to have guiding you on a trip? Well, you know, I really do want someone who knows the territory very well. Absolutely. Um, because, I mean, think about it. They have very flu few clues to, to travel with you. So, you know, I did a journey with one of the women and I'm under a blanket with earphones and eye shades. What can she, what cues can she pick up to know what's happening inside me? Cause I'm not talking, I'm busy. 
And so she, because of her experience, is able to intuit into my journey, almost as if she's there with me. And, um, and of course, she was physically with me, but I always felt her presence. And that was so different from the um, trips, really, that I took in the 60s, which were in nature. And my intention was spiritual. I never did the, the big concert music, you know, rock music trips. I never did that. But even in nature, it's not the same as having someone right there for you. And then toward the end of that journey, she did this very sophisticated clearing and cleansing with energy work that she did with some shamanic tools and fans and feathers and um, incense, you know, different smells. It was just extraordinary. And that probably went on for an hour. She really cleared things out. So at the end of the journey, I came back in a different space. I mean, really different. And that, that, you know, people certainly have wonderful experiences in nature and it's different with a guide, with somebody sitting right there. You write about one instance in which a guide explained to you that they were working with a client. I guess that was the word they used. And, and during the trip, the client relived an experience, I think it was a father or a grandfather had had while they were drowning. And I can imagine that must be a very difficult situation if you're a guide and the person you're with is having the experience of drowning. Right. Yes. These women have so much experience working with people. I mean, when I talk about how experienced they are, they spent years working on their own, their own healing before they began to sit with other people. And, and by years, I mean five, six years. And the truth is they continue to work on their own healing. The use of entheogens um, covers a whole lifetime. So they worked on themselves. And then with supervision, with guidance, with a mentor, they began to work with other people. So um, they've experienced a lot of different situations. I mean, one woman told me a story of she realized at a certain point in a journey she was sitting with someone they had to go to the ER. And that's a very, um, that's a big decision because you walk into the emergency room and you're confessing to an illegal activity. And she said, we were just lucky that the doctor on call was um, simpatico and he protected her and treated the client. But um, that took a lot of courage and she had to have real confidence in her own experience to make that judgment call, to know when to go get help. I can imagine that for, for these people working outside of the legal system without any medical insurance to cover them, if, if anything should go, go wrong, and with all kinds of legal exposures, if I think in one instance you, you described a, a, a guide who had been sued by uh, one of their clients and, and, and no certification of any sort. Right, right. And of course, that was for inappropriate behavior on the guide's part. So there's, you know, there are cases of that, that, that the community and the profession has to begin to deal with because there is no a professional body like there is the American Psychological Association where, you know, you can lose your license. If, if the person is not licensed to begin with, how can they be managed? And, and so this is being explored now. It's an important discussion to have right now. I know that the state of Oregon has already uh, licensed a couple of people to serve as guides uh, for psilocybin trips. And the state of Colorado is doing the same thing right now. And to the best of my knowledge, those uh, licensing or certification requirements are, are very minimal. People with no particular educational qualifications can take a, a, a test and a six-week course or a 12-week course and go into business or, or will be able to soon, I think, in, in the states of Colorado and Oregon. Yes, it's the requirement is a high school diploma. So I, you know, I don't know what to say about this. I mean, you know, we're all just sort of hoping for the best. 
but uh, people with experience are very concerned about the potential risks here. And, and an online course, whether it's six weeks or even some of the courses are a year long, that doesn't replace the, uh, the years of experience of working on yourself. I mean, w one of the women I interviewed, when I told her, look, licensed therapists, there's no requirement for them to have their own therapy. She just could not believe it. She didn't know that. And she just could not believe therapists could open up a practice and do therapy with people without having done their own work. And that has really been one of the rules for this, this, um, that for the underground women. And, and yes, they are outside of the normal structures and they also have, uh, colleagues. They can call each other and they have physicians they work with and they have licensed therapists they refer to. So they've been in practice a long time and they have built up a professional network that, um, provides extra options for the client and for them. And they're very careful about the medical intake that they do. And that's one of the key warnings I tell people. And I say, you know, if you're going to do a ceremony and nobody's taken a really careful medical history, don't go. So that's how important that medical history is. A good point. I mean, you're in a room with people who are also using some sort of a very powerful uh, entheogen, and uh, you may not know. Uh, what will emerge in, in the other people who you're with? Yes, there's that as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you've interviewed I, I, 15 people intensively for your book, and even above and beyond that, you refer to many, many other people who are sort of in the, per, the periphery of uh, the sort of work you're doing. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about the uh, can I call it the the training? It's that's really not the right word. I, I know you point out it's not a training, but they go through a process and apprenticeship. I think is the word you use. You yes, use. that's the word I use. And everybody is different. I mean, one woman did a traditional training with the Shapipo shaman, so she spent a good bit of time in Peru. That's a certain kind of training, and and one of the stories she told me, and I think she's the she's one of the few who really did this kind of training. She said, after five years, maybe six, the shaman said to her, you're ready to sing, which is the, is the mechanism of the healing in the Shapipo ceremony. She said, no, I'm not ready. She waited a whole other year before she felt ready. And during that year, she sat at the shaman's elbow. You know, this is the phrase for an apprenticeship that you are right at their elbow right next to them. And he would sing and she would sing a nanosecond after him. So she was like right, right behind him, so to speak. And then together with him, she could say, well, did you see this in the person's body? And what happened when you did that? And to check out her shamanic perceptions as she was learning. Um, and so she waited that whole extra year. We don't hear that from people these days. You know, people people come up to me at conferences and say, "Grandmother Ayahuasca told me I should be leading ceremonies," and I'm I'm trying to man, you know, control myself. And I say, "Well, how many ceremonies have you done?" And they say five. <laughs> and I think, well, you know, in six more years, maybe. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's a whole different um, perspective on what it takes to do this work. Which also means that uh, there are certain risks involved, to be honest, for anybody who chooses to to move in this direction, whether you're working with a, a professional psychotherapist or a shaman or an apprentice of one or the other, there are lots of unknowns. Yes, yes, there, yes, there are many unknowns and, and things cannot be controlled. There has to be a willingness to go with what's happening. And, and the phrase, and I remember this phrase from the 60s, you know, when I was around many of these same um, communities and situations, I was living at Esalen in the late 60s. The phrase was trust the process. Mm -hmm. And that, that is a, a very accurate phrase, and it's not so easy to do. Especially if the process is that you're freaking out. Yes, exactly. <laughs> 
<laughs> which you know is the sort of thing that I'd be very concerned about. But they have they after their years of their own work and their training and their experience, their their um, working with people. Uh, even more experienced than they were. They worked with elders in the 60s. Um, they sort of have an intuition that they trust that's deep in their bones. And I don't, I don't have that kind of certainty. I, I always, I'm always filled with questions and doubts. That's my nature. But they have a real kind of somatic embodied certainty mm-hmm. that they, can, they will have the intuition. They will have the help from spirit guides, from their ancestors. They have help from unseen sources that, um, again, this is different for me. I mean, I'm much more open to this now, but it's, you know, I don't have the same confidence they have. Mm -hmm. They're deeply, deeply in their bones. Um, They trust the process and they know they'll have help and, and they know the territory. This is, this is a different kind of person. Now, I'm a little surprised to hear you say that about yourself, Rachel, because we've done three earlier interviews on ayahuasca, and in one interview, which we're going to re-release soon, incidentally, on grandmother ayahuasca, as I recall, you, you described that you felt you were having a personal relationship with th- th- this being, this ayahuasca being that you, you called grandmother ayahuasca. And then later on, you write in your book, well, you're not so sure it's real. Well, this this is my own craziness. And this is why I was never one of these guides. <laughs> yes, I absolutely had and have that relationship. And you know, that relationship helped me to write that book. And that relationship did not help me write this book, because this book is about all the medicines. And it's not really just, a, it didn't come out of that relationship with that plant teacher. So I, yes, I'm, I'm absolutely certain about my experience and I don't, I still have doubts and questions. It's just part of my nature to question. I, I kind of think that's healthy. I, I'm pretty much the same way. I attribute it to, if you want to get esoteric, to the fact that I have Libra as my rising sign. So I'm always weighing and balancing alternatives and <laughs> rarely settling on just one. Uh, but one of the very important aspects of, of your new book is that you chose to limit, uh, for the most part, all of the people you're writing about are female. And I think that's crucial. That's interesting. You know, I've been afraid to talk about that too much because I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to get... Um... Boxed in. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> that's a nice way to put it. Um, some of was I just, you know, um, I'm in my mid-70s. I've listened to men uh, all my life. And it's like enough already. <laughs> there was that. <laughs> And I and but to be more subtle about it is I thought the women have a special relationship with the medicines. I felt they have a more personal relationship with the spirit of the plants, um, with different types of medicines, with their ancestors and healing guides. I I just felt they had a sensitivity to this other world that I was really wanting to to explore and highlight. I think that's part of the gift. It's not to say that the men don't have that, but it's diff- it's it's held differently in the male energy. And I, you know, some of it is that one of the conferences, and this was, I think, around 2013, something like that, big conference. I spent a whole afternoon with one of the best trained, charismatic, wonderful male guides, as experienced as the women. And we spent an afternoon together. I got his life story. And it's, it's, it's like I can, the texture is different. It's, uh, it, he doesn't have that same quality of intuition and working with these unseen energies that the women are so, um, so expressive about. I mean, they say such interesting things that are hard to define. And in the three or four hours I spent with this guy listening to him, he didn't go into those really subtle realms. So one example I talk about is this, this one woman guide said, 
when when she feels the client needs more space in what she's doing in her ceremony, she needs to have a little more space. She's getting boxed in or too narrow. Or she said, "I'll I'll take a big expansive breath, and that will help my client." So I'm I'm taking notes. I'm writing this all down because I didn't record. I it's too delicate uh, and a legal situation. I took notes instead of recording. And I'm transcribing my notes and I and I think, what does this mean? I intuitively understand that the guide that the woman creates, the woman elder creates a spaciousness inside herself. And somehow the client under the blanket <laughs> journeying benefits from that in her own inner spaciousness, that it that spaciousness travels or is communicated or merges with the client. That's the kind of inner outer um, permeation that the the men don't talk about in quite the same way. And that's, that's, a, that's specifically what I was interested in. As a parapsychologist, I, I might say, oh, they're, you, they're telepathic. But I don't think uh, using a word like that begins to get at what's really going on. Right, because it's also so somatic. It's so embodied. Mm -hmm. and, and the breath itself, you know, is one of those things that travels from the inner world to the outer world. And so there's already an, an exchange of inner and outer with the breath. And this is, this is what Jung began to call synchronicity when, you know, a client was talking about, what was it, a beetle? And then a beetle flew in the window of the of the therapy room. That that something changes from within, and then something changes is reflected in the outer material world. And so I think that's part of what this woman was describing: that she creates more space inside herself, and that gives her client more space in the journey. I think I just think it's a wonderful statement, and not that I understand it completely. Because there's mystery involved in this. Will you compare the these women to the ancient priestesses in the Eleusinian mysteries, who, who, according to some scholars, have guided people through a psychedelic experience? Also, yes, and it was it was preparation for death, and they were also sworn to secrecy. So there are some real parallels, and when we think about these the entheogens entering into the modern world, we don't have a category for these women underground elders. We, we don't have a role. You know, we're mostly looking at the psychedelic medicines in terms of a medical uh, setting that we, where it's, we're, take, we're collecting data, we're doing studies, we want it to be cost effective, and we're looking at symptom reduction. We'd like to understand how it works, so we're exploring mystical experience and some, you know, the the neurological studies. How does this work? But but the outcome measures are symptom reduction. The women work in very different ways. I mean, they're the way they hold and understand their work and the journeys is a much bigger uh, way of holding it, and it and it's far more sacred. I mean, the the eldest of the eldest the elders, she says, even if these medicines become legal, I will continue to work underground. So it's this real sense of that's where the sacred world is. You describe one experience with a, a woman who is a good friend of yours, who isn't part of the 15 women you studied, but was also, as I understand it, a, a, maybe equivalently experienced. And you were talking to her about how in some sessions for people, it's natural to come up with family issues, especially issues around parents and, and childhood. And, and this friend got right in your face and told you very definitively, we have no interest whatsoever in family issues. Well, this, this was a mistake I made from the very beginning. I thought these women were psychedelic therapists, and they're not. Not at all. They're interested in a transformation process that goes way beyond what psychotherapists think of, you know, having a better life, you know, doing better in your relationships, uh, managing yourself better. It, it, they have, you know, one woman says, 
you know, you develop your intentions for yourself and for humanity. I mean, look at that vision this woman holds that you're journeying, yes, for yourself and for humanity. It goes way beyond just you. And so, yes, this friend of mine, I was, what was really interesting to me about it is this was early on as I was interviewing people and She's um, shamanically trained with a, a Peruvian shaman, but she didn't work underground. That's the only reason I could use her name. And she has many books. Her name is Connie Grouds. And I, she, I was, sh I was certain she yelled at me. She that she came right in my face, like inches away from my nose, and screamed at the top of her lungs. And I backed off and I quieted down and I stopped asking, you know, family of origin therapy questions. <laughs> and, and hours later, I asked a friend of mine who had been part of the conversation. I said to her, Connie had left. I said to my friend, I said, did Connie yell at me? <laughs> did she scream at me? And my friend said, no. And she looked at me as if I was crazy. Why do you ask? I said, because that's how I hold that memory. I still hold it that way. And, and my understanding is she did a shamanic intervention. She shocked me out of my standard therapy questions and perspective. And that is when I really shifted and realized this is what William James would call a conversion experience, that there's a real shift in the architecture of the psyche. It's not just a resolution to, well, now I'm no longer angry at my mother. It's, it's a real shift in, in how I identify who I am and how I am in the world. And, and this happens in other situations as well as psychedelic journeys. And the most predictable ones are spontaneous awakening experiences and near-death experiences. So people do have these spiritual awakenings where there's a real shift in who they are and their priorities in life and people change their lives. And, um, there was a study done on what was called quantum change, and there's a paperback book about it done by some psychologists. And what was so interesting, they just advertised for spontaneous spiritual experiences, nothing to do with drugs. And the people they interviewed, they followed them up 10 years later, which is very hard to do in data collection. 10 years later, they found most of the cohort, most of the group. and. The way the people had changed their values and their priorities in life remained stable. So they, <clears throat> they were much more community oriented, much more empathic, interested in relationships, how they could contribute to the world. They were more likely to be working in terms of climate change and protecting the environment. They really shifted their values and how they spent their lives. And this is what, this is what the women look for when they're working with someone, they look for that kind of transformation. So in effect, these special people are functioning as priests or priestesses or shamans, and, but without any title, without any official authority of any sort behind them, uh, based on really something uh, well, a combination of the training that they had and a calling, a deep calling. A deep calling, yeah, yeah. And, and I was called to graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a wonderful thing to have a calling because many people don't have one. It served me well, but it, and it's different. It's very different. We, we, I went to graduate school. I was a graduate student for ten years, and. I, I, in graduate school, you it's really more about indoctrination than uh, education, in a way. You get indoctrinated into the Western materialistic model, the, the paradigm that becomes primary. And I remember I had a mentor, Arthur M. Young, who was a, a brilliant inventor and a cosmologist and an astrologer. And after I graduated, I went to visit him and he picked up his ephemeris and said, well, how long were you working on your dissertation? That was six of the 10 years. And he, he said, uh, well, it's going to take you another six years to undo all the damage the university has done to you. And looking back, I can say he was correct. 
He was correct. Yes, but how wonderful that he could tell you that. Yeah. But these women, uh, in a, in a way, they bypass that indoctrination. In a way, it's almost as if they are indoctrinated uh, differently. Yes, they are. One woman apprenticed with a Native American who it was based. It, this kind of spiritual apprenticeship is like an adoption, and she calls him grandfather, and uh, that you know, she was adopted into that tribe. So this is a different kind of uh, training. And she's the one who told me she did a, um, a vision quest, you know, on a mountain. And I think it was three days and nights, no food. Okay, no food. All right. You know, people do manage that. I wouldn't like it, but, <laughs> um, but no water. Yeah. Now that's different. That's that does something very different to the body and the consciousness. And she did a number of those vision quests. As I recall, you wrote about how she woke up one night sleeping alone without a tent under the sky and felt uh, a heavy presence, something pushing on her and, and opened her eyes and it was a jaguar. That was a different woman. You oh. see, they have some of the same, they, some of the same ca capacities for these experiences. Yes, I, yeah, I, I don't know why I think a tent would protect me from a, <laughs> a mountain lion and a jaguar, but, you know, but anyway, yeah. And, and what was interesting about that story, she, she, she didn't move. She, I mean, the jaguar was on her and um, it scratched from her leg, from her hip to her knee. And what's interesting is she spent the next couple of days um, in communion, it, it, talking with that jaguar. So you see how she took the animal from the, the, the material world into her inner world and worked with that spirit animal. And she felt part of what she learned was about fear because her nature is not to be afraid. But she she did learn about fear to see an, this animal on top of her. She did learn about fear this way, and she felt this was something she had to learn about to work with people who, who most people do have fear when when getting ready for a journey. And so it was this kind of um, uh, this kind of initiation for her. And and of course, being around any wild animal is going to. Uh, um, activate very instinctive fear mechanisms, I would think. Yeah, just the thought of it is enough to scare me. <laughs> this is why I'm not part of this group. <laughs> well, you described a very interesting episode in your own process when you heard this story. Uh, and, and it's because she described, if I remember correctly, being in the United States in the mountains of northern Idaho, where you know there aren't any jaguars. It's very confusing, but I here she's telling me this incredible, energetic, spiritual story. And as she's telling it, she's reliving it. I mean, this kind of story has energy that lasts a whole lifetime. So it, the event happened 30 some years ago, but it, it felt extremely real and present. I mean, the energy continues. And I made a therapeutic error. So she's telling me this incredible shamanic story, and I correct her and say, "Well, it probably wasn't a jaguar. They're not. They don't travel that far north." As if I know anything about wild animals. I don't know anything. <laughs> and so, and then I, I realized, you know, this was a mistake, mm -hmm. and I stopped myself. You know, it was like a know-it-all statement when I really didn't know anything, and I kind of got back on the energetic mm -hmm. track with her. And, and continued with her experience. And we both entered into this experience, which I have to give myself credit for. I'm actually good at this. I'm good at entering into this experience with her, but there's no way I'd be on a mountain at night <laughs> in or out of a tent. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I then had to Google, you know, the mountain lion, a puma, a jaguar, what's their territory? How do you differentiate them? And frankly, it's very confusing. <laughs> it's hard to differentiate these large cats, but they are at the top of the the predator, and um, you know they're very frightening. 
Even after she told me this experience, which frankly, I don't think she had repeated to anybody. I think this is something she, I mean, who do you tell something like this to? It's, and, uh, and so, you know, once I, I corrected myself and got back on track with her, you know, it opened, it opened this, this story and this energy to continue to work on her. It was still alive in her, but to be able to share it with me opened it up again. And then she was able to connect it with other things in her life that happened decades later, but had to do with a jaguar and, you know, a little statue of a jaguar, carving of a jaguar. So it became even more meaningful as this, as this spirit animal unfolded in her life. Well, it strikes me that this story that you've told so well is an example of the difference between a masculine and a feminine approach to, to things. She's speaking to you at the energetic level and uh, the masculine mind wants to say, is this true or not? <laughs> she had no doubts. She never, she didn't go there. Yeah. And, you know, once I got my ego in check, that I can go with her, and, and I had no doubts about this story. And so, participating with these women, hearing these kinds of stories, it changed me. You know, I, I benefited. Um, I'm different than I was, you know, four years ago when I started this, five years ago. I, I really became more permeable myself and more open. I'm just as afraid as ever. My fear did not reduce, <laughs> but I'm, uh, I feel like I'm more open to the spirit world, to en the energetic world, the sense of this things live in the inner world and the outer world and they move back and forth between each other. You know, um, I, 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 when it's appropriate, I try and always include I'm in therapy with a Jungian analyst <laughs> that, you know, after all these years of being in therapy, doing therapy, I'm still in therapy. Mm -hmm. And I was reporting a dream and she said, well, and there's like a masculine energy in the dream. And she said, well, look for that energy to show up in your life. So again, you hear this kind of Jungian understanding of that synchronicity between the inner world and the outer world. And this is not the kind of psychology or therapy that's taught in graduate schools. This is more esoteric and it's got a mystical, magical quality to it. But this inner outer is so interesting in, in the psyche. Mm -hmm. And, um, and of course, that's what's happening in a journey. You talk about how when you work with these women, sometimes you would have a, a day-long conversation. It could last six hours or so, uh, going into the details of all the work they do. And it affected you uh, to the extent you felt like uh, you were having a contact high. Absolutely. Absolutely. I can tell you the story. I spent, I spent it was 12 hours, 9 in the morning to 9 at night, with two Native American women. And so they, they work with prayer and songs and peyote. And, you know, we, we spent most of the time in the dining room at the dining room table. I'm making notes. We're talking. We break for lunch. We go out to dinner later. Somebody else joins us. I mean, it's a whole day. We're back in the house. It's nine o'clock at night. And they, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's, they're, we're, we're women. And they say, do you want to use the bathroom before you leave? Because I have an hour's drive. And I answer, I don't know. <laughs> so when they and they they got it immediately, and so they sort of took charge, and they said, "Well, go to the bathroom." <laughs> so I just obeyed them. I went to the bathroom. I did need to pee. I come back out. I'm still kind of whiffy, and um, they say, "You know, come this way." And we walk through the dining room where we had spent all day, and they open a door I hadn't noticed. And it's a door that leads into their ceremonial room. So as a researcher, I sat all day taking notes and I missed, I was never invited into the ceremonial room. I missed, I missed the presence, the door, I missed it. So we go into the room and they have all their shamanic objects and feathers and stones and different things. And they do a clearing on me. 
for like 30 minutes and they're, you know, they're whistling and they're ruffling feathers around my <laughs> energy field and, and I got myself together and I drove home. And I thought, well, you know, this is, there's, there's so much in this story that, that yes, it's the contact high, but that I was shifting worlds without knowing it. And also that I could have easily missed. I could have really missed so much in that ceremonial room. And so I just felt very, um, very lucky that I serendipitously, <laughs> you know, um, sort of got ungrounded and that they, they helped me in that way. And they opened up this other world that I didn't know about. Well, in shamanic practice, as, as I understand it, uh, which is probably pretty minimal, uh, the idea is that the shaman is able to travel to the upper worlds and the lower worlds at ease. They're just as comfortable in, in these uh, mystical worlds as they are here on the physical plane. But I gather that not all of the women you interviewed work in, in a shamanic mode. No, they 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 don't all, uh, and they don't. Uh, only one or two of them have um, uh, mentorships with uh, indigenous shaman. So the others are uh, trained in other ways. Well, th there's a Native American medicine man, which is a little different. Uh, but some of them trained with you. You do know the book, The Secret Chief, about um, Leo Zeff. He was he was one of the first people in the San Francisco Bay Area. You're nodding. You were there at the time. <laughs> you know, in, in the late fifties, early sixties, he was working. He came out of retirement when he discovered these entheogens and went back into practice working with them. He thought they were so powerful, and that's the calling. These the recognition that these medicines are so powerful and have such potential for healing that people are willing to take the risk to come and, and out and work underground. And so he trained a number of the people because, you know, they're, they're elders and they worked with some of the historical figures. And others of them, you know, worked with Stan Groff and, and um, Ralph Metzner, you know, people that have written lots of books and we recognize the names. And, and so they have lots of different sources for their apprenticeships and their, their own work on themselves. Did you find a common thread uh, that ran through all 15? Well, besides their fearlessness, I, I would say their uh, commitment to their own healing. So yes, it was they worked on themselves intensively for years before they began to work on others. And they continue to work on themselves with the entheogens. And that's a whole different, it's a life with psychedelics and that the healing continues. And, you know, one of the women used the phrase, uh, an experience she had continues to work on her. There's this sense of a simmering pot that it, it that, that things keep moving inside. And uh, it's not just about the ceremony, but it's about the process. And I found, I found the information that um, Albert Hoffman, who synthesized LSD-25, he lived to an old age. I think it was 102. When he was 97, he did a, an LSD trip. So you get a sense of this whole lifetime of working with medicines, shifting worlds and realities, and, and you, you know, the sense of um, permeability with other worlds. You know, I, I um, interviewed um, Houston Smith's widow. You, you, Kendra. Kendra. I don't know if you know her. Um, she's turning 100 this summer. Mm. And, and I thought the story was of such historical significance. And it was also another story of a woman um, uh, not, not having a voice in, in the in the culture. I mean, she was born a few years, a few years after women got the vote. So, you know, she didn't have the opportunities that women have now. But she in Houston, well, here's how it went. Aldous Huxley in, Calif in California, um, 
I, I might be missing something here, but somehow I think it was Huxley was at MIT where Houston was teaching. And Huxley knew there was something happening at Harvard. There was a young psychologist at Harvard. That young psychologist was Timothy Leary. So he sent Houston and Houston took his wife to meet Timothy Leary and do an LSD trip in Leary's home on the third floor <laughs> of this old house in Newton, Massachusetts. So Kendra took two or three times the dose that Houston took. And this was Houston's first experience. I mean, he'd written about the perennial philosophy and mysticism and the core of all the world religions, but this was his first direct experience of, of union, of a mystical experience. Kendra took two or three times the dose that Houston took, and she had her own experience. And, and we sat and talked for an hour or two, and then I just asked her, Kendra, has anybody else ever interviewed you about this? This is a historic experience. And she said, no, nobody ever asked. Nobody seemed interested. <laughs> this is a statement from a woman from that generation. And, you know, we hope things are better now. Well, forgive me if I seem presumptuous, Rachel, but I, I'm under the impression that this story you've just told exemplifies uh, a reality that that all women seem to face, that they are uh, subordinate, they're second-class citizens at, at, at some level. I think uh, the concept that's come up in the Black Studies program of intersectionality, how all, you know, being a woman, if you combine that with being uh, black or brown, they, they intersect. It makes you even worse that there's this whole issue of social status. And uh, ev even women of high social status, and Kendra, I suppose, would be such a woman, the daughter of a philosopher, the wife of a famous professor, and, and and so on is still and a, and a PhD in her own right. Yeah, the, the women have. I mean, it, it talks about in the Bible how women are forced because of uh, Eve's sin to give birth uh, and and to experience pain. But there, it's like there's an extra wound you carry just being born female. And, you know, I don't think people uh, address it so directly, but I've seen it over and over and over again. I, I wonder, am I being presumptuous to say that? No, I, I, I think you're exactly right. And it's and it's uh, it, it feel it, I think I think this is a generational thing for me. I'm I feel a, a little hesitant to to state this on my own, that I'll get some backlash of some sort. And I actually agree with everything you've said. And, and, and it continues. You know, one of the women who testified in this current trial against Trump, that she had her own unfortunate um, encounter with him, where he was abusive and crossed boundaries. She's walking out of the courthouse, and she says, it's still a man's world. This was just a few days ago. This was on the news. And that's her statement. I mean, this is how difficult it is for women to speak up and, and to have their voices heard. At the same time, I'm under the impression that uh, being wounded in that way can also be a strength. It's not always a strength, but it can become a strength. And I imagine these healers or uh, spiritual guides that you've interviewed uh, turned it into a strength. I think it, it helped to make them more sensitive. I think they were, you know, I asked them about their childhoods and their early spiritual experiences, just spontaneous as children. And they had very interesting dreams and experiences. They were already shifting realities. So they were called to this work because they were often more sensitive. And so they were different in a few different ways. And what was interesting to me is many of them did not have children. Of course, some did, but more than half did not. So they were able to uh, dedicate their lives to this process 
of their own work on themselves and their own explorations. So that's another commonality that they have. And it's a and it's a different sort of a life as a woman. And it, again, it speaks to the priestess quality. You write very briefly in, in your book about, uh, I, I would call her the, the, the grandmother of psychedelics, uh, Mexican shamanist Maria Sabina, uh, after uh, uh, whom I... I'm stumbling over words, but what I mean to say is really the title of your book is a tribute to her. Yes, she. one of the songs that she would sing in ceremony was, uh, she's a Mexican corandera working with psilocybin, and the little saints, the mushrooms. She would sing, I am a woman who swims in the sacred. And that's as good a description of these women as, as anything. They are living in a world that's qualitatively different. I think you could trace an important uh, landmark in the modern evolution of entheogens in Western culture to, I guess it was Gordon Wasson and accompanied by a few people, Stanley Krippner, I think was one, I've interviewed him about it, went to Mexico to uh, experience psilocybin with Maria Sabina. Yes, and, and in this story, I want to point out that Gordon Wasson's wife was the mycologist. She knew about mushrooms far more than he did. And she yeah. of, often not even mentioned. <laughs> A, another example of another. Uh, <laughs> uh, the way women are uh, put in the back seat. Yeah, and, and what happened was that once this, once the, once this became known, there was a Life magazine article about the ceremonies with psilocybin, with magic mushrooms. A lot of um, Westerners went down to this little village, and Maria Sabina had to move to get away from them. And she, she said, you know, with all, it was beatniks and hippies, and and she said, you know, the the mushrooms are no longer working, and so it, she was just inundated, and. Um, and this speaks to the problem that we have now as a culture. How do we work with these mystical medicines? And we don't have a, a clear way to do it. I mean, so far, we've got a medical approach to them. We have a corporate approach, people wanting to make money. But we don't really have a sacred way in the culture. And the sacred approach is in the underground. And this is a challenge for us with this psychedelic renaissance. How do we hold these entheogens in the biggest, most sacred, most spiritual kind of way? And in, in that sense, these women you interviewed are at the forefront. Yes. Yes, that's correct. And they don't have a voice, exactly. And yeah, I've been very disappointed that, they, that the research teams have not sought them out because uh, they, they certainly don't want to go public public, but I know that a good number of them would be happy to meet with the research team, and they have not really sought them out. There is one woman who is uh, somehow, because of who she is, is working with a, a study team and helping to train people. And she's been able to cross that divide. That's one. Well, there's been a, an interest in what's called transpersonal psychology, which is the, the branch of almost mainstream psychology that does study the sacred, the mystical, the uh, psychic, and the intuitive side of life. And that, that would be a place where you could merge, I suppose, the uh, sacred side with, with the empirical therapeutic aspects of uh, psychedelics. They're writing about the critical importance of a mystical experience. It's still held in terms of symptom reduction. So, um, and you know, there, there's sort of like this, well, is it the molecule? What makes the difference? Is it the chemical? Is it the molecule? Is it material, in other words? Or is it something else that's happening? And we don't really know. And there, there are, I, I think there's a, a chemist at Davis, UC Davis, who's working on developing 
uh, a psychedelic that doesn't take so long, that doesn't involve the psychedelic experience, but changes the brain in a similar way. And is that going to work? I mean, it's sort of like years, I think I wrote about this in the ayahuasca book. Um, there was a study that was planned using shaman. And in order to get a, a standardized dose of ayahuasca, they freeze dried it, which is the, what they've been doing in Spain when they do the research. And when they showed it to the shaman, the shaman said, you know, we're not going to do a ceremony with that. <laughs> you know, there's no spirit in those capsules. You've lost the plant. So we, you know, we don't really know how to relate to things that we can't measure and we can't control in a study. And we just don't know how to, how to bring that, how to bring that into our culture and transform our culture so that we, we can relate to those mystical aspects even more. Well, so maybe there's a real benefit to the fact that there is an underground that, that isn't constrained by the uh, requirements of uh, Western intellectual authority. Yes, and I think that's why this, the eldest of the elders says she would continue to work underground. I think it preserves it. And, you know, there was um, a recent article in the New York Times where they found in what they called a burial cave on an island off the coast of Spain. And they, they found, you know, remnants of bodies and they analyzed the hair. And it had, um, it had evidence of psychotropic plants in the hair that had been used because they could tell from where it is in the hair how long those plants had been used by that person and it had been used for over a year. This is from 3,000 years ago, by the way, these, these remnants of bodies, 3,000 years ago in a burial cave. So again, you get this sense of underground and preparation for death and dying. And that the medicines here, here was a way that that culture 3,000 years ago had a way, a, a ritualistic way of using psychotropic plants to prepare for death and dying. You know, we're, we're not quite there yet. Well, I know Aldous Huxley famously uh, took, I think it was mescaline as he was dying. I think it was a shot of LSD. Uh-huh, LSD. Yeah, I think Laura Huxley gave him intramuscular LSD. Uh huh. I I know of other examples. In fact, we did an interview about a very well known person in the Bay Area. I bet you knew Jean Millay. No. Well, Jean Millay was a researcher and a shaman, and. Uh, uh, married at one time to Ala Raka, the tabla player, and a uh, very important person in the psychedelic movement early on. And uh, she died about two, three years ago and took LSD as she was dying. Uh, it would be consistent, I suppose, with the original insight of Leary, Alpert, and uh, Metzner when they wrote the psychedelic experience based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, so we have little glimmers of these sacred ways of using the entheogens. There's been very little follow-up along those lines in the uh, literature that I'm aware of. No, it's, 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 it's existing underground. It's very quiet. And, you know, of course, I know many of the uh, psychologists on the research teams. And, um, you know, there's nothing crazy happening like there was in the 60s with Leary and the, the, the drugs getting out of the lab. And, you know, people are using these entheogens in, in the way of living with these medicines throughout a lifespan, with getting experience with them, exploring, doing their own healing. They're not just doing symptom reduction on themselves. They're using the medicines in the way these underground women use them in their own healing, the way I do. And, and it was in talking with Kendra, she just sort of, you know, dreamily said, Oh, I'd love to do another journey. <laughs>
Well, you know, it's interesting. You did spend uh, almost a full chapter in your book writing about one man. Uh, I think his name was Al Hubbard, who who was very instrumental in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, and maybe into the 70s and sort of spreading the gospel of LSD. And, and he became, uh, even though in, in some ways he, I think you describe him as well, almost a fraud in the sense that he had a, a, a PhD that he got purchased from some diploma mill, uh, but he seemed to function as, as an authentic uh, spiritual guide. Absolutely. He's, you know, when we talk about set and setting, he deserves the initial credit. And, and I, I, I feel very strongly we should really recognize him more. Yes, he was a rascal and a scoundrel. I think he worked for the government in MK Ultra. I mean, it, you know, he had uh, nobody knew the whole truth about this man. Um, but he had a spiritual experience as a child, and he felt he had a relationship with the Virgin Mary his whole life, and that that relationship led him to these medicines, and 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 informed him that it was a spiritual experience he was working with, that this was a, a spiritual conversion experience. So yes, they helped alcoholics. This is in the 50s. The research was used a lot with alcoholics. Yes, they could help alcoholics, but it was because it was a spiritual experience. And so he's the one who framed the journey with um, music and earphones and eye shades so it would become an internal experience. People would be turned inward. And then toward the end, and he would have religious objects in the room and, um, you know, art, artwork to kind of inspire religious feelings. And uh, he, he really deserves the credit. I think Leary uh, presented a paper in the early 60s on set and setting. So he often gets the professional uh, credit for that, but it really came from Al Hubbard, and it came from his early childhood experience. And this led me to asking the women about their early experiences. And I've had um, early spiritual experiences as a child, but the women had, <laughs> they traveled in their in their experiences. You know, I would sometimes sort of receive or recognize that I was shifting in some way. But some of the women reported dreams that were just, you know, I've listened to people's dreams for 40 years. I'm still listening to people's dreams. And these dreams are like over the top that they just, you know, they would meet entities from other worlds. I mean, they really, before they used any medicines of any kind, they could travel in their dreams and in their sometimes in just hypnagogic states they could travel. So that's part of what I mean, that they were very open to other worlds. And I think this guy, Al Hubbard, as crazy as he was, I think he had this alive inspiration from the Virgin Mary that really guided him in his commitment to, I mean, he's called the Johnny Appleseed of LSD, and his commitment to, to you know, wanting the world to change as a result of these mystical experiences. Now, I, I have to add, he would do this, I think it was called an advanced training, and he would take people out to the Mojave Desert. The, you know, the desert is a, a, a classic spiritual landscape. You know, the Desert Fathers, you know, the Middle East, the desert. And so they would trip out on the desert and then after a day of recovery, he would take his little group to Las Vegas, <laughs> assuming <laughs> that they would have better luck gambling. <laughs> but no, they didn't. So that didn't work. So he stopped that. But that was the experiment. So you see, there were two sides to this man. He was a very complex character. There were two sides to him. Do you think he had an influence in any way on the women you've interviewed? I think he influenced everybody. I think he influenced, you know, I think there is a lineage of Al Hubbard, Myron Stolaroff, Leo Zeff, that then went to a few of the elders who I interviewed. But this is a little esoteric. People may not even know these names anymore. Mm -hmm. 
But it was that when I mentioned the book, the best way to click into this is uh, the Secret Chief book. Mm -hmm. And that was Myron Stoleroff's book about Leo Zeff. And, and he said, you know, this was one of the characteristics of what would make a good guide. And the description of Leo Zeff was just, I, I'm, I don't have this exact quote, but the, he had an unusually compassionate heart. Yeah. I mean, this is a wonderful description of someone who's he had spent his whole life as a therapist, mind you, but that this was a capacity that he had that was helpful in in being present for people during journeys. So I think there is a, a lineage here that's uh, now historical. And I, I have to say, I'm writing this book, Interviewing Women. I spent a good six months on Al Hubbard trying to find everything I could about him. And there's a lot of mystery about him because he kept a lot of secrets. When it comes to having these early childhood spiritual experiences of such a profound nature and many spontaneous uh, shamanic or psychic experiences as a, as a child, there's quite a bit of literature that, that su suggests that these kinds of experiences are correlated with early childhood trauma. I get the feeling that children who are traumatized go inward. They, they turn inside or they even find imaginary worlds where they can be protected and safe. And that opens them up to these psychic worlds. Did you find that in, in the women you interviewed, that they'd had more than the average amount of childhood trauma? No, I didn't. Huh? Um, but uh, Donald Kalshik writes about that. Um, and because uh, children during a, a trauma event will leave their bodies, and that opens up, that sort of opens up that availability and accessibility to another world. As a matter of fact, I was working with a client and he talked about, he, he had been sexually abused as a child, and he talked about this experience of leaving his body. And I found that movie with Jodie Foster, um, uh, where, where she travels, and she's an astronaut who travels oh, yeah. and and shifts realities and time zones and she meets her father and the the section of the movie where she's traveling through dimensions i played that for this client and he said that's exactly what i did he recognized it immediately so that is one way people enter into other worlds but i didn't find that with these women especially they just had an openness uh and a, a willingness and and an engagement in these, uh, if they would meet an entity, they would talk, they would have a conversation as a child. No academic understanding of this, just the natural thing to do. And I, I just found it very unusual. And I included, there is a questionnaire that looks at early childhood spiritual experiences that people can look at these 20 items and say, oh yeah, I had that, or no, I didn't have that, but I, and and it kind of brings up these memories and a number of the people who are interested in this world or working with the medicines even professionally you know the the researchers they had childhood experiences that were sort of like little stepping stones that they kind of followed throughout their life i mean this is how i got to esalen at 21 i graduated from college and i went right into the esalen residential program because I had been following these experiences, where could I find people who were talking about this? And that led me to Esalen. So, you know, I was the youngest person there. I was, <laughs> you know, people were working on, you know, loosening up their defenses. I didn't have enough defenses. <laughs> I was, <laughs> so, um, but that, but it's almost like little clues in life to find your way there. And these women had that, and this is something I do share with them. But they had, they reported extraordinary experiences. Well, Rachel Harris, you have made a sincere and authentic and profound contribution to the uh, emerging world of psychedelic research and therapy by introducing the voices of women who otherwise would be uh, 
silent, would remain unheard. So uh, I really have to compliment you on the service that you're performing for a very large and growing community that would, uh, but for your work, be unaware of this. I just want to point out, I dedicate the book to the women I interviewed. It's their story. It, it's a shame that uh, I think for the most part, they will remain unnamed. Yes. Well, Rachel Harris, thank you so much for being with me. This was a, a very heartfelt, and I keep using the word profound, interview. I think it is. It's a delight to be with you again. Thank you, Jeff. I, I, I so appreciate the time. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us. The inaugural issue of the New Thinking Aloud magazine was just released on March 1st. You can download a free PDF copy from the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website.